I'm Dick Summers. I'm the Johnson Professor of Military History on behalf of Colonel D'Alessandro, Dr. Crane, Mr. Giblin, to all of us in the Army Heritage and Education Center. I'd like to welcome everyone who's come here tonight and extend a particularly cordial welcome to the members of the Army War College DDE class of 2009 who are on a campus this week and next week, and we're very gratified that uh, so many of you are taking advantage of the opportunity to come over and tonight and learn some more about the historical perspective on the profession of arms. Great power, superpower, hyperpower. Such appellations have been applied to America in recent years and decades. But as we look over the 400 plus year span of American history, we need to remind ourselves that it's been or barely 110 years that the United States has been even a world power. It was only the Spanish-American War in 1898 which projected us beyond being a continental power to have overseas possessions and thus perforce to become a world power and a major actor on the world stage. And with those possessions came responsibilities and obligations and conflicts. And our program tonight will look at one of those earliest conflicts in the Philippine Islands between 1899 and 1902. We're exceptionally fortunate to have as our speaker tonight someone who has carefully studied that conflict in its various dimensions. He did his undergraduate work at Cornell University, his master's and doctoral work at Duke University. Ever since he was in graduate school, he has come here to the Military History Institute to do research in our holdings. He went on to teach at Duke and North Carolina State and Bowdoin. Since 2001, he has been a professor on the faculty of Alvernia College right here in Pennsylvania at Reading. It's an easy drive down the interstate. He's made that drive many times to continue his research for his work on World War I, World War II, and the subject that he'll be sharing with us tonight on the war in the Philippines. Please join me in giving a cordial welcome to Professor David Silvey, who will speak to us on a war of frontier and empire. Professor Silvey. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have about seven microphones on me at the moment, so let me just make sure that everybody can hear me as I, as I talk. If you can't hear me, wave your hands. Okay, I see, I see no waving, uh, waving of hands. Um, let, me, let, me, let me start with a movie. And some of you may remember this uh, movie when it was first released. It was a John Wayne action flick back in 1945 called Back to Bataan. John Wayne, uh, Anthony Quinn, uh, and a range of other uh, uh, studio actors um, in a movie about America's position, America's experience in the Philippines during World War, uh, World War II. And, and I'm not making any claims for Back to Bataan being a Oscar-worthy movie, although I personally am a John Wayne fan, so anybody talks bad against the Duke, they have to talk to me first. Um, but I found that movie fascinating for a reason that has a lot to do with the war that we're going to look at tonight. Because Anthony Quinn's character is named Andres Bonifacio, and he is held up as the grandson of the original Andres Bonifacio who was a Filipino revolutionary in the 1890s. Now, in reality, Bonifacio never fought the Americans. He was assassinated by a fellow revolutionary named Aguinaldo um, in the middle 1890s, before the US even got involved. 
But in the movie, that history is rewritten. And Bonifacio is made to be, to have been the leading revolutionary leader against the US. And John Wayne steals his best moves. At the end, Wayne uses a guerrilla warfare trick that he had read about, he says, by bon uh, uh, done by Bonifacio to ambush the Japanese and win the day. And I want to suggest to you that that's a fascinating thing to do. For a patriotic American film to pull as its historical influence, explicit historical influence, a revolutionary guerrilla leader that it claims fought against the US merely 50 years before is a remarkable statement about what had happened since the Philippine-American War ended. To give you a modern day example, if Bruce Willis, and I just chose random, I could have said Arnold Schwarzenegger, whomever, Bruce Willis had a secondary character named um, I can't even come up, um, Yamamoto. And in the end of the movie, Bruce Willis, to win the day against whoever the standard villains of the day are, I'm, I'm never sure, uh, um, Muslim terrorists, revitalized Nazis, um, uh, evil multi-corporations, had stolen something from the attack on Pearl Harbor to win the day. That would be the equivalent of what happens with Back, back to Bataan. And one of the things that I want to do tonight is not talk to you not just about the war itself and how the United States wins both a conventional campaign and the guerrilla insurgency that followed, but talk to you about how the two sides became so reconciled to each other that in 1945, Anthony Quinn could play the role of Andres Bonifacio. Because what it suggests is that, th what I want to suggest is that that reconciliation came out of the way that the war was waged. That you cannot understand the results of the war unless you understand how it was waged. And you cannot understand the relationship between Americans and Filipinos unless you understand how the war was waged. So I'm going to try and balance things as we go through this, not only looking at how the war was fought by both the Americans and the Filipinos, but how that war then comes to be memory and myth and legend in the century afterwards. A memory and myth and legend that still uh, exists today. Now, before I get into the war, let me um, uh, let, me, let me lay the background for you a little bit. Uh, Dr. Summers talked a little bit about the way that the United States was emerging um, onto the world stage, but let me reinforce that um, for you and then, and then talk about the Philippines uh, a bit. The thing about the 1890s was that the United States came to feel that, that this was their moment, this was our moment. This was the decade when America had thrown off the last remnants and, and after effects and consequences of the Civil War, had begun to, had closed down the frontier, as Frederick Jackson Turner put it, had industrialized, had survived the Depression of 1893, had become modern, a modern industrial nation most of whose, whose citizens lived in cities rather than on the countryside. And along with that modern industrial nation, a lot of people felt, should, uh, mo excuse me, a modern industrial nation should have a modern industrial military. In the 1890s, that meant the Navy. Giant armored cruisers, which the US began building early in the 1890s, succeeded eventually by battleships and then by dreadnoughts. And in the 1890s, the United States Navy begins to recover, driven by the theories of Alfred Thayer Mahan um, and by the arms race that was breaking out um, in between the European navies. Um, the United States Navy begins to build and grow and become 
not just a military force, but an example of American modernity. This is what our ind industries can do now. By contrast, the United States Army was, to a certain extent, left in a backwater. It had shrunk down after the Civil War. By 1875, it was down to 25,000 men. When Arthur MacArthur went to a, a cocktail party and told a woman there that he was a captain in the US Army, she said um, uh, that she was surprised to meet an officer in the Army because she supposed that the Army had all been disbanded at the end of the Civil War. MacArthur, who had risen to the level of brevet colonel in the Civil War, had reverted to a lieutenant at the end of the Civil War and spent 23 years as either a lieutenant or a captain. There was no room to rise in the ranks in such a small army. In fact, in one of those horrible ironies, after the massacre at Little Bighorn, the 7th Cavalry saw the most rapid promotion of its surviving officers it had in two decades. Because all of the officers along with Custer had gotten killed, and so everybody got bumped up a rank as you went on. This didn't change that much um, in the 1880s and 1890s. And when the United States goes to war with Spain in 1898, and I will, I will come back to that, um, come back to the start of that war, the, while the Navy is essentially modernized and ready to go, the Army, for the most part, is not. And the military effort in uh, Cuba uh, and against the Spanish on the Army side is marked by a fair amount of inefficiency and problematic. Uh, and problems. The Philippines had been experiencing a similar stasis. I apologize if there are any Spanish citizens in the room, but the reality is that the Spanish Empire had been stagnating since the, ninth, since the 18th century. Its great glory days of the 16th and 17th century were long gone, and by the 19th century, the Spanish Empire and the Philippines, which was its major geographic, um, uh, its major uh, colony at that time, were sleepy, not unindustrialized, and very much still looking back rather than forward. The social structure in the Philippines was based on what sociologists call a uh, patron-client relationship. Everyone who lived in the Philippines had a patron who looked out for their interests and clients whose interests they looked out for. Relationships were personal rather than political. It had been that way since the 17th century, and it would remain that way throughout the 19th. Now, I note nobody in the United States expected us to acquire the Philippines when the year 1898 started. Most Americans could not find the Philippine archipelago on a map. Um, uh, if you spotted them, Hawaii, Guam, Japan, China, and Formosa. That sounded funnier in my head than it did coming out, but so we'll move on quickly on that one. Nobody expected to take, nobody, nobody wanted the Philippines. Nobody thought, that the, nobody thought that the Philippines was a, was a useful uh, land, uh, land to grab. Nobody, the, the British had taken the Philippines from the Spanish in the 18th century and then handed it back afterwards because they, no, they had no use for it. And America felt the same way. What America wanted in the 19th century was access to China. They wanted to be able to trade with the Chinese. And what American attention there was to the Pacific was focused very much on getting through what they called the open door into China. There was one exception to this, or one exception who is critical to this story. And his name, and you may be familiar with it, is Theodore Roosevelt. He was the assistant secretary of the Navy 
in 1898. President William McKinley had put over him as Secretary of the Navy an elderly gentleman named John Long, who he thought would tamp down Roosevelt's natural pugnaciousness. When the war scare with Spain arrived, Roosevelt waited until John Long was out of the office sick. And then he sent a telegram to Commodore George Dewey, head of the American Asiatic Fleet um, in, the, uh, in the Western Pacific, that on the outbreak of war with Spain, Dewey was to sail to the Philippines and sink the Spanish fleet there. When Long returned to the office on February 25th, he said, in my short absence, I find that Roosevelt has come very near to causing more of an explosion than the main. But he didn't countermand the telegram. And so when war breaks out between the Spanish and the US, without even McKinley really being aware of it, Dewey sets off for uh, the Philippines. British naval officers who were there, uh, who, had, who had socialized with the Americans, said, uh, sort of watched them go and said, um, a, a fine set of fellows, but unhappily we shall never see them again. Because they thought that the Americans were going to lose. And it was actually a fairly risky gamble. It was monsoon season. Dewey only had two supply ships to go with him. And he couldn't return to Hong Kong because it was technically a neutral port. He sails into, uh, they sail to the Philippines. They check Subic Bay and it's empty. And then they sail into Manila Bay where the Spanish admiral, who knows the antiquity of his ships, has carefully positioned them in the shallow part of the bay so that when the Americans sink them, his sailors will have a chance to walk on shore and survive. And he, better than those British officers in Hong Kong, understood the relative disparity in power between the ships of a modern industrial nation and that of a stagnant empire. Because by the end of the day on May 1st, 1898, as one observer said, the shores around Cavite glowed bright with the flames of burning ships. Two of the Spanish ships looked like skeletons. The fires consuming them made their bones appear black against the white hot heat, like a gateway to Hades. Dewey sent his telegram back home, uh, the famous telegram back home. Not one Spanish flag flies in Manila Bay. Not one Spanish warship floats except as our prize. And one of his rewards was to be put on a range of tchotchkes, including mugs, cigarette cases, matchbooks, um, and anything and everything that American merchants could come up with. But McKinley doesn't know what to do. They, America owns the Philippines. But McKinley isn't expecting this. And so he dithers. He tries to decide what to do one way or the other. And while he dithers, a Filipino revolutionary leader by the name of Aguinaldo, who has come back to the Philippines on one of Dewey's ships, raises an army and marches on Manila, sweeping aside all the Spanish defenders before him. You have this very strange situation where the Americans own Manila Bay, the Spanish own Manila City, and Filipino, the Filipino insurrectos, or the Army of Liberation, as Aguinaldo calls them, own everything else. And nobody's quite sure what to do. McKinley can't decide whether to hand them over to the Filipinos, whether to leave the Spanish and the Filipinos to fight it out, whether just to take Subic Bay, or what. But in the meantime, he sends troops. He loads them up in May of 1898 from the Presidio in San Francisco, 
and sends nearly 10,000 American soldiers across the Pacific to, um, uh, to the Philippines. To do what at the end of that, he doesn't know. He hasn't decided yet. There's, there's, a, there's a wildly entertaining moment. They pull up at Guam, the, this fleet of American warships and troop ships, pull up at Guam, and they fire, it's owned by Spain, and they fire um, warning shots at the Spanish fortress. Surrender or else. The Spanish commander paddles out in a canoe, and he apologizes to the Americans because he doesn't have any ammunition to return what he takes to be a salute. He doesn't know they're at war. He's got no communications. So they apologize to him and take him captive. And that's how we acquired Guam. When they reach the Philippines, the Americans manage to um, convince the Filipino, insert, uh, the Filipino army to give them a chunk of land on the southern side of Manila as part of the, the siege of Manila. And this is when things begin to go wrong between the Americans and the Filipinos. Filipinos. Now, maybe it was inevitable, but this is really when you can start to see things break apart. The Spanish want to surrender, but they don't want to surrender to the Filipinos. They're worried about a massacre. And so they negotiate secretly with General uh, Ewell Otis, who is the commander of the Americans, um, and arrange for what can only be described as a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. On August 13, 1898, the American troops attack Manila. And after about half a day's fairly sustained resistance to uphold their honor, the Spanish garrison in Manila surrenders to the US and is promptly, over the next several months, loaded up onto ships and shipped home. The, the, uh, the Filipinos are not told of this. They are not allowed to come into the city of Manila after the Americans capture it. And so you get this weird switch in August. The Spanish disappear from the equation, and now it's the Americans holding Manila Bay and Manila, and the Filipinos holding everything else. And nobody's sure what to do because McKinley is still dithering back home in the US. He finally decides to send a negotiation, uh, a group to negotiate an end to the Spanish uh, war with Spain. Um, but he still hasn't decided what to, do, what to ask for when they leave the US. He literally sends them over to Paris to negotiate with Spanish and says, I'll tell you what to do about the Philippines later. One of the, um, uh, uh, one of the negotiators gets a sense of how much of a shock this has been for the rest of the world, that the US has swept the Spanish out of the way this much. Um, he's sitting at a dinner party, and he's next to a beautiful young woman in a sort of spectacular ball gown. And he's sort of being avuncular and, and flirting with her and so on. And the, she's the daughter of the German ambassador. And she says to him, I was against you in your war. I was on the side of the little dog. Whatever his faults, at any rate, I wish he had taken a good bite out of you. He got up and had it, went off to have a cigar with the rest of the men. But um, finally, um, uh, uh, McKinley decides to take the Philippines. He buys it from Spain for $20 million. Um, purchases it from Spain for $20 million. And when news breaks of this in January of 1899, the Filipinos are shocked. Aguinaldo says, the conscience of man may pronounce its infall infallible verdict as to who are the true oppressors of nations and the tormentors of humankind. Now, this is a, Aguinaldo had to know what was coming, and there's, there's certain indications that he did, but he was genuinely hoping to, um, uh, to convince the US to hand, over, hand this over. 
the war doesn't break out right away. And in fact, what, what happens is a very sort of interesting um, uh, coexistence of both sides through January and even into February of 1899. They hadn't been getting along all that well before this. American soldiers were bored um, by their uh, uh, by their holding on to Manila. Um, venereal disease rates had soared um, during the occupation. Um, uh, American soldiers, a, a journalist, a British journalist, remembered that American soldiers were calling the Filipinos niggers. And the Filipinos, and here's where the quote gets very interesting, the Filipinos were beginning to understand what that meant. So from the very beginning, there was a certain amount of friction. But it really didn't break out until February of 1898. And on the 5th of February, 1898, a unit, the 4th of February, I'm sorry, a unit of American soldiers from the 1st Nebraska Regiment encountered a Filipino patrol way out on the lines outside of Manila. And what happened then is not clear. The Filipinos said the Americans fired first. The Americans said the Filipinos fired first. And both sides had their own reasons for um, uh, claiming that. What we do know is that two Filipino soldiers ended up dead. And that after that, there was a night of sporadic fighting between Filipino and American units on the line. When morning came, Arthur MacArthur, who was the commander of one of Otis's, uh, it's now actually, um, uh, uh, sorry, Arthur MacArthur, who commanded one of the brigades, asked permission to go on the offensive, figuring that the war was going to start sometime, and this was as good as any. And the Americans attacked at about 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, I want to pause for a second here and say the conclusion of this battle was not foregone or foreknown. American weapons technology was not necessarily better than Filipino, what the Filipinos had. The Filipino soldiers were experienced in a way that many of the American soldiers were not. The Filipinos, both the Filipinos and Americans, had time to dig in and build entrenchments over the course uh, of the months that they were facing each other. Numbers were about equal. And yet, over the course of the 5th of February, 1899, the Battle of Manila turned into an overwhelming American victory. About 59 American dead, about 300 American wounded, versus several thousand dead on the Filipino side. And the question that I want to ask and, and I want to talk about for a moment is why it was so lopsided. Because I want to suggest a, a couple of things about why it was so lopsided that, that don't fit into the traditional narrative about this. First thing to consider, it was Sunday. Well, who cares? Sundays. What's different from Sunday or Saturday? Well, most of the Filipino officers were gone to church Sunday morning. And so the Filipino units were not entirely leaderless, but they were leaderless. They, uh, they, they were, had many fewer uh, officers than they had previously, than they had usually. And in a world in which you define yourself by whose client you are and who your uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, and who your patron to, to not have your patron there, your officer there, means not only that you can't do your duty, necessarily do your duty to them, you can't be seen to do your duty to them. The importance of the patron-client relationship is that you are seen to be upholding your responsibilities. And without their officers there, the Filipino soldiers couldn't be seen to be doing that. The second part of that relationship that I want to highlight is that your responsibility as a client was to do what your patron asked you, but not to the point of getting killed. You didn't have to die for your patron. In fact, it would, it would destroy the whole system if you were supposed to die for your patron, because then your patron would start running out of clients. 
And so what you would expect to happen if the Filipino army was made up of clients who did not have their patrons with them and did not want to, were not willing to die for those patrons, was that they would fire on the Americans until the Americans got close enough to present a genuine threat, and then they would retreat. And that's exactly what happened on February 5th, 1899. Every American unit remarked about it, that they would charge the Filipinos. I mean, think about this. These are Civil War veteran officers who are mounting frontal assaults against a prepared enemy, knowing what had happened at Gettysburg and at the, uh, uh, Petersburg and at Fredericksburg and so on. And they would get to about 300 yards, the killing zone. And instead of getting, starting to get knocked down, the Filipinos would drop back to their next position. And the next thing, and they would do it again, and the same thing would happen. Not because the Americans had overwhelmed them, not because the Filipinos were cowards, but because they understood what their responsibilities were and the limits of those responsibilities. And those responsibilities did not include dying for their patrons. By the end of the day, the US owns the area around Manila. And they have to decide what to do next. Aguinaldo is confused and doesn't quite know how to respond to this. And he has another problem which is he's losing credibility. He is the leader of this army of liberation. He is the senior patron of this army of liberation. And that army of liberation is losing. Anyone who suggests a way of winning thus is not only going to help the army of liberation, he's going to present a political threat to Aguinaldo. If another patron appears who can fight better than Aguinaldo can, then they have no reason to keep Aguinaldo as leader. So what does he do? A gentleman by the name of Antonio Luna suggests reforming the Filipino army, training the officers consistently. Aguinaldo has him assassinated. Because he's more worried about keeping control than he is about beating the Americans. He's more worried about his domestic power than he is about, um, uh, about beating the Americans. And that's the way it goes through the rest of the conventional campaign. In the spring of 1899, the Americans march into um, uh, central Luzon um, uh, and begin sending out ships with um, soldiers to the other islands of this, uh, of, of the Philippines. And everywhere they go, they witness the same thing. If you make a determined frontal assault against a Filipino position, they will not resist to the moment of contact. Fighting Joe Wheeler, who had been a Confederate general in the Civil War, who had joined the US Army after it was over, as, a, as, as an enlisted man who had risen back to the rank of general um, during the Spanish-American War and, into, um, uh, and in the Philippine War, um, would literally lead his men into these frontal assaults explicitly because he knew that this wasn't the Civil War. His, his men had to stop him after they charged and, and a couple of times and say, General, we're fighting the Filipinos. And Wheeler would say, what did I say? And he said, you said, let's get them Yankees boys before we charged up the hill. And, and, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Go, go on from that. Um, the flip side of this, I've, I've talked sort of about the, the way that Filipino society and culture has affected, affected the war. Let me suggest, and this is especially important as the war converts from a conventional war to a guerrilla war late in 1899. Aguinaldo flees up into the, into the hillsides, and the Army of Liberation disperses and begins 
mounting insurgent assaults against the Americans. Let me, let me flip this and talk about the way that American society and culture, and specifically the culture of the United States Army, begins to affect the war. Because one of the things to remember is that this US Army had spent the last 30 years in the American West fighting a counterinsurgency against Native Americans. And when the Filipinos turned to insurgent warfare, American officers and NCOs and enlisted men recognize this and know what's going on and understand how to wage this kind of campaign. And let me, let me give you an example of this. And, and this is not a military example of this. This is an economic example. When US forces reach the um, hemp islands, of Leti and Mindanao and, Sam uh, and Samar, um, they open the hemp trade with the United States up again. Hemp was used at that point for making ropes. Um, whenever I lecture my undergraduates about this and I say hemp, they get this knowing look on their face and start nodding, which worries me a little bit, but never mind. They do this, they open the hemp trade up again, even though they know that the hemp fields are controlled by Aguinaldo's forces and are taxing the hemp farmers. They are literally handing money to the insurgents by doing this. But they do it anyway because what they also know is that by doing this they will co-opt the businessmen and merchants of the coastal cities who trade the hemp. And those are the folks they think who control the, the, the society of the island. So because of their experience, they're literally willing to hand money to the insurgents in the interest of co-opting another specific set of Filipinos. And it works. The business classes and the merchant classes and the shipping um, magnates um, in Leyte and so on come over to the American side very quickly. The thing is, there's, this, there's a little pause as this is building up where the Americans don't really know that the war hasn't ended. Otis sends a telegram to McKinley saying that the war was over in, in the spring of 1900, um, asking to be, mission accomplished, he said, asking to be, or roughly, roughly says, asking to be replaced, and Arthur MacArthur becomes the commander of American forces. Otis goes home and war's over. He doesn't need to deal with this. Um, MacArthur's a fascinating character. I, I understand now where Douglas MacArthur got his personality in all its positives and negatives. Um, and as soon as MacArthur comes in, MacArthur doesn't think the war's quite over yet. He knows Otis does. He knows McKinley does. But he doesn't think that the war is quite over yet. And yet, in his very first month of commanding American forces, who shows up on his doorstep? But uh, William Howard Taft, sent there to be the first civilian governor of the Philippines. Two more dissimilar people you cannot imagine. MacArthur was tall and lean, rode the horses, um, uh, loved to be out um, uh, on campaign. Taft weighed 300 pounds and traveled with his own bathtub because hotel bathtubs did not fit him. There are various accounts of the greeting MacArthur gave him. MacArthur said, oh, I you know, welcomed him right up. Come on in, had, sit down and dinner. Taft said that he made him stand on the docks until the sweat froze on my brow. Now, anybody who's been to the Philippines knows that nothing freezes in the Philippines. So I'm a little skeptical about both accounts. But they never got along. And one of the things that stretches this war out, even though the American army essentially understands what it's doing, is the, the conflict between MacArthur and Taft. 
and the conflict between the military side and the civilian side. MacArthur would do things like, Taft would ask MacArthur for, uh, for an officer to repair the sewer system in Manila. And Taft would, and, Min and MacArthur would send him a name. So Taft would nominate the guy, and then MacArthur would veto it. Show that showed him. The situation gets bad enough, the insurgency gets powerful enough, that in the fall of 1900, Douglas MacArthur, who is a cadet at West Point and played baseball, was heckled at the Army-Navy baseball game with the following chant. MacArthur, MacArthur, who is the boss of this show? Is it your father or Emilio Aguinaldo? Aguinaldo. But MacArthur had an idea about what to do. And it was a double-sided idea. MacArthur wanted to continue the reform of the, the Spanish legal system. He wanted to create um, uh, elementary education for all Filipinos to teach them English um, and other basic skills. Um, he wanted to rebuild the sewer system, as I, as I mentioned already. And he also wanted to mount a sustained counterinsurgency campaign against the Filipinos. He concentrated civil, the civilian population into camps um, guarded by American soldiers and barbed wire. He created garrisons to protect important spots and then spent, sent flying columns out to travel anywhere through, uh, all throughout the Philippines to chase um, Aguinaldo's uh, forces. He expanded native forces, the Filipino scouts, um, uh, and a range of other um, groups recruited from uh, the na native populations. The Americans used torture uh, to get information, the water cure, uh, among other things. And over the course of December and January of 1900, uh, uh, 1900 and 1901, the Americans began to cripple the Filipino insurgency, cut them off from their support, convinced Filipino civilians that it was better to um, be on the American side than otherwise, chased them down to their um, hiding places, um, uh, destroy their uh, support um, uh, sources of food um, and so on. And in the first three months of 1901, 20,000 insurgents surrendered. Now note one thing about this, and this is especially critical. What would often happen when people surrendered or came over to the American side was that the Americans would immediately put them back in charge of the place they had just been fighting over. Remember, these are the local patrons in a lot of cases. The officers of these insurgent groups are the local patrons. So they would surrender to the Americans. And the Americans would say, great, you want to be governor of Leyte or North, northern Luzon or this valley or whatever? You're the one who's running it anyway. Just run it for us. And so they, they, would, they literally co-opted the power structure that was already there during this period. Not only does this get in on their side those who had already surrendered, it convinced those who hadn't surrendered that they could. What's going to happen? Pretty much the same thing I'm doing now, except the Americans aren't going to be shooting at me. This is a positive development. Aguinaldo, on the other hand, can't offer anything to his clients at this point. He's in hiding. He's way out of touch. There's a, there's a moment during his flight from the Americans where he comes on a band of headhunters in the northern Filipino highlands. And they're traditional enemies of his tribe, the Tagalogs. And they welcome him in and say, you know, you're fighting the Americans. We welcome you in. By the way, we're having a head shrinking ceremony tonight. You have, you're invited to come. So they shrink two heads in front of him and then look at him thoughtfully. 
and sort of suggests that he moves on quickly. But so he's cut off. He can't reward his clients in the way that they want to. What really shatters, I would argue, the insurgency actually comes in April of 1901. Aguinaldo is captured. An American flying column under a gentleman by the name of Frederick Funston marches deep into insurgent territory and manages to capture Aguinaldo and bring him back. And MacArthur puts him up in reasonably lavish accommodations. He's watch, he gets to watch American soldiers play football games um, from his window and convinces him to put out a call to the insurgents to surrender which MacArthur has printed in Spanish, Tagalog, and English, and published all over the Philippines. And after that, more and more insurgents surrender. The problem is, is that with Aguinaldo gone, and this is true of a lot of insurgencies, with, with the leaders gone or crippled or reduced in power, there's nobody left to surrender for everybody. It's not like World War II, where Hitler could kill himself and Raider steps in as the next Fuhrer and surrenders the forces. There's no central leadership left to surrender. And so the insurgency continues, but sort of trickles off, gets lower and lower and lower in intensity, with a couple of fairly dramatic exceptions. At an American outpost in the, uh, in the southern islands, uh, in the southern island of Samar, uh, Samar, a Company C of the 9th Infantry Regiment is ambushed at a place called Balangiga in September of 1901, and um, 48 Americans are killed. Um, the American response, Jacob Heard Smith, the commander of the American forces, tells his subordinates to turn Samar into a howling wilderness and kill all men over the age of 10. Now, they obey him more or much less, but it gets ugly there for a very long time. And meanwhile, one of the fruits of concentrating the civilians comes home to roost. That was probably the worst mixed metaphor I've ever been responsible for. Fruits rarely come home to roost. Forgive me. Um, ripens, overripens. A fruit over overripens. Okay. Concentrating the civilians, they can't build sewer systems for them, for all the concentrated civilians. They they don't have the time or the the ability to do it, and so cholera breaks out in the spring of 1902, and about 200,000 Filipinos die of it. And in, in the outbreak, George Marshall who is a young second lieutenant, just graduated from West Point, arrives just as this is about to happen. And he remembers, he arrives at his duty post in the middle Filipino islands, and he talks to th three of the local nuns at 9 a.m. in the morning. He said all three of them were dead by 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Perfectly healthy at 9 a.m., dead of cholera by 1 o'clock. And so what you begin to see in 1902 is that this insurgency and counterinsurgency, which is actually just about ending, nonetheless gets darker and darker and darker. And this begins to leak home. And there are Senate hearings and court martials and so on. And the vision of the, of the Philippine-American War gets very negative back home in the US. But things have calmed down enough by July 4th, 1902, that Roosevelt, who has now become President of the United States, is able to declare that the war is over and essentially be right. There's still a certain amount of conflict going on, but he's, he's pretty much right. Let me suggest, just by way of wrapping up, let me suggest a couple of reasons why it happened this way. And let me also suggest how this war became a symbol not only of nationalism for the Filipinos, but of reconciliation. I think I've highlighted for you the reasons why 
both sides won or lost. The Filipino, the, the societal organization, the patron-client system, essentially made it very difficult for the Filipinos to wage an effective, a war effectively against a modern opponent. On the flip side, the American, the combination of experience in the American military, along with something I haven't highlighted as much, but it's still critical, a sense, of, a vigorous sense of nationalism that connected Americans together, and especially American soldiers together, in a way that the Filipinos weren't, essentially allowed the Americans to overwhelm the Filipinos. But one of the most interesting things I think about this war is how rapidly the two sides reconciled with each other. Despite the cholera outbreak, despite the atrocities committed by both sides, by the 1920s, the Filipinos had become, in American eyes, what I would call a most favored race. And I'll give you an example of this. 1924, the US Navy decides to get rid of all of the African Americans in the Navy. Don't like having African Americans and they were going to get rid of all of them. But they needed mess stewards. White people shouldn't serve white people. They needed mess stewards. They went for Filipinos. Because the Filipinos were seen as reliable and um, uh, supportive in a way that African Americans weren't. They were a favored race. And let me finish up on this final thing to sort of give you a sense of the reconciliation. And then, and then I'll open it up for questions. Think about the symbolism of Douglas MacArthur in World War II. I shall return is held up by Filipinos and Americans alike as a binding promise between the Philippines and the Americans. But who's the guy who's making that promise? The son of the man who defeated the Filipinos in 1899 to 1902. The son of the man who destroyed the Filipino Army of Liberation. The two nations have come so close to each other in the 50 years that not only can John Wayne star in a movie with Andres Bonifacio, but Douglas MacArthur can come to be seen as the savior of the Philippines and the savior of the relationship between the United States and the Filipino nation. Thank you very much. Can you talk just briefly about the tribal organization of the Philippines and particularly how it affected Aguinaldo and his leadership? Oh, yes, that's a very good question. And, and to a certain extent, I, I, I sort of elided that a little bit in, when I was talking about the patron client relationship. Um, there are an enormous number of different ethnic groups, tribes, um, religious groups in the Philippines. Um, and, and probably the most important thing to remember is that they didn't feel connected to each other. They did not feel a sense of patriotism or nationalism or a sense of being Filipino. There was no, when this war starts, there was no larger conception that I am not a Tagalog or a Moro or uh, any of the other hundreds of, of, of tribal groups, but a Filipino. Instead, they saw themselves as primarily members of those tribal groups. And Aguinaldo's tribal group, the Tagalogs, were not necessarily well liked. They were one of the richest and most dominant tribal groups. They had not necessarily been all that nice to other tribal groups. And so there's a certain suspicious, suspicion of Aguinaldo coming out of this. Um, couple that with his habit of assassinating his political rivals, and you get a chain of command that is very shaky indeed. There's a, I didn't have time to go into it. Antonio Luna gets assassinated by Aguinaldo's presidential bodyguard. And you have to read the report that they sent him sometime. They said, essentially they said, he was yelling at us, so we shot him. <laughs> it, like, oh, we had no choice. Uh, anyway, so does that, does that, okay. And then, sir. Since you're a movie about, uh, you know there was a movie made of that incident where the uh, uh, company was attacked. Oh, oh yes. yes. 
Oh yeah, it's it's the um, the it's very interesting because um, there have been a, there have been a lot of movies done done about that. The the, the Balangiga massacre is um, it's fascinating in a whole set of respects. There's sort of this sense on the American side of this is not legitimate. Don't you know you've lost? They called them it's they called a massacre. It was actually a perfectly reasonable ambush by a local Filipino insurgent. He just caught Company C. Um, uh, napping, one, essentially napping one morning. But the Americans refer to it as a massacre because, you know, how dare you keep fighting after we know that the war is over? So there's, there's sort of that sense of that. I have not seen the movie. Is it, is it any good? <laughs> wow, backhanded recommendation. Okay. Um, sir, and oh, wait. Very good. I'm trying to get this speaker to work, which is going out on this side there. I was struck in listening to you by certain parallels between what's going on in Iraq and the Philippine experience, and also your mention of the Indian Wars, which I think is a very fascinating era, and uh, what the carryover there might have been to the American Army. But in the Philippine insurrection, as, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was no outside source of support for the Philippines, contrary to what we see going on in Iraq. Would you comment on that? Um, uh, yes. Uh, the the question is about outside support for the for the for the Filipino insurgency. That's a very good point. I was I was told, however, in in speaking to an audience in an army building, that I was not allowed to say anything nice about the U.S. Navy. <laughs> so. Um, I, I, I'm going to tread lightly. And actually, but that's a very good point, is one of the things that happens, there were, there were people who would have supported the insurgents. The Germans were actually were interested. But the U.S. Navy, and especially what was called the Brownwater Navy, that is the Inland Navy, did a very good job at cutting off the Filipinos, not only from the outside world, but from each other. I mean, you can imagine Aguinaldo's problems with his chain of command added to being unable to essentially communicate with them because they're American steamships. So th that's a, yes, that's a very good point. Um, and the U.S. Navy played a role of it. My question has to do with the, uh, the Spanish clones, if you will. How, how large a group of people there, the banking, commercial classes, did as you said, right. to the, go off the right. the Americans, right. and then immediately entered into the social Right. The, the question is about sort of the, the, the sort of Spanish um, upper classes, upper, it's, and that also is very a uh, very interesting um, topic. The the Filipinos broke themselves down into three main um, uh, three overall uh, I don't want to say ethnic groups because it's not quite correct. Let me call it racial groups. They there were peninsulares who were Spanish people who had been born in Spain and come to the Filipinos, Philippines. There were insulares who were of Spanish descent, but who had been born in the Philippines. And there were indios who were native Filipinos. The peninsulares were the top of the, the ladder. The peninsulares were below them. And then of the indios, they used to say that you can dress a monkey up in clothing, but he's still a monkey. So they were not well liked at all. Those upper level groups, had, a, had an incentive to shift to the Americans um, fairly quickly uh, because it would essentially, it was clear that it would preserve their control. Americans were not interested in, in extensive land reform. And so there is, if you look at it, there is a large contingent of Spanish descended Filipinos who shift to the Americans very early on, even really even before the conventional war is over. There are um, mer Spanish merchants and bankers who essentially throw their lot in with the Americans. If I may uh, ask the next question, I know we want to pass the microphone around to each of the questions. Uh, America's first contact in a military sense with the Muslim people since the Barbary War, with the, the Moros in the southern islands, would you talk, please, about the nature of those relations early on, and yeah. how they evolved or degenerated over time, please? Yeah, very. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, it's sort of it's sort of the reverse of this of of what we might think 
stereotypically, but early on the relationships were very good. When the U.S. got there, uh, first off, we, we actually negotiated a, a, a new tr treaty of neutrality with the sultan of what was then called Sulu, the sultan of Sulu, who was the main, who we thought ruled over Sulu. We didn't discover until later that he actually had no real power. Um, but so very early on, the, during the actual war that I'm talking about, the, the, the Muslim areas of the Philippines were among the most peaceful parts. Um, and in fact, we supported a lot of Muslim groups against uh, Christian Filipino groups that were uh, massacring them in some place. Um, so it's a sort of, it's a very interesting um, uh, stereotype. What happens in 02 and 03 after the main insurgency is over is that a civil war breaks out against the Sultan of Sulu and we get involved in that. And that turns into what we call the Moro Rebellion or the Moro Uprising. Um, whose main claim to fame seems to be that's where the 1911 U.S. 45 um, handgun um, uh, came because you, you couldn't shoot a Moro with a regular 38 because he just refused to stay down. Um, you had to have a 45 um, or a baseball bat, as the case may be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's sort of the reverse of what you would expect it to be. It was very good relations at the beginning and then, then broke down. Um, two very different questions, kind of continuing on the, the last question. Uh, I vaguely remember from my reading there was an ongoing uh, insurgency, guerrilla warfare for decades. And was that the case? And then also, uh, if so, what was the connection of that with the continuing problems they have in the Philippines today with some of the, I guess, communists? Right, right. And the second question, uh, what did you find in your research uh, both from the standpoint of quality and volume of documentation of the American colonial or imperial regime there. Was much of that stuff uh, uh, shipped back to the U.S. and, and uh, resident here? How much was destroyed during the Second World War? And so mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. One. Do you mean, in terms of the first question, the insurgency, do you mean, a you mean after the... the yeah, it's... It, <sighs> One of, the, one of the issues becomes with insurgencies, it's, it's not clear where you, as, as I sort of mentioned, it's not clear where you actually draw the line. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt can say on July 4th, 1902, we've won, the insurgency is over. Whether all of the Filipino insurgents actually agree with that, it's not clear. Um, and in fact, if you look, there's a lot of sort of fighting going on after July 4th, 1902 that looks an awful lot like an insurgency. Although the officers in their reports are not allowed to use the word insurgents. They have to use the word bandits. Um, the privates felt like they were getting shot at either way, so it didn't really matter. Um, there was sur surely a fair amount of un unrest going on even for decades if, from ver with various different ethnic groups. What I would suggest about that and why it's different from the insurgency is that I think what was going on throughout the early 20th century was that the Filipino nation, the idea of the Philippines as a nation, was beginning to take over the, the archipelago, and it was being resisted. That is, in the same way that the Civil War, to a certain extent, can be seen as resistance to a certain conception of the United States, the Moro Rebellion and the Huck Rebellion later on can be seen as a resistance to a certain idea of the Philippines. And had less to do with the United States than it did to do with that Filipino, Filipino nationalism. Um, in terms of the sources, a remarkably large amount of stuff has survived. Um, the, uh, most of it, MacArthur was an inveterate note taker. Um, and he used to write the most flowery language um, it's really, man never read a, uh, met a multi-syllable word that he didn't like. Um, and I should talk, I'm a professor, you know, wh what do I use? Um, so, but most of it was either copied or made it back to the U.S. Amazingly, very little of it, as far as I know, was destroyed during, during World War II, with the exception of a fair amount in Manila in, in 44 and 45, when the Japanese were sort of destroying a lot of, there's a lot of it out there. Um, and. Um, it's a shame that it hasn't been used as much as it might be. Um, Brian Lynn is obviously a great exception to this. What ha there isn't a lot of, and what hasn't been used, is what the Filipinos were doing. 
there's still no analysis, as far as I know, of the fight of the Army of Liberation from when Aguinaldo lands in early 1899 until they actually make it to Manila. We just don't know what, it was, what they did to fight the Spanish. So we, we know the American side pretty well, but not the Filipino side. We probably have time for one more question. I've read that most of the fighting in 1899 and 1902, large part of it was carried on by volunteer troops. Mm -hmm. How did you recruit for that? Or was it difficult to get people to volunteer right. to go over to fight in an insurgency with economic incentives? Or? Um, it, no, actually. In fact, it was, um, uh, it was well, let me, let me rephrase that. In 1899 and 1898-99 uh, and 1900, most of the people fighting were volunteers. Um, uh, in, in 1900 and 1901, they were a different kind of volunteers. One that had been authorized by Congress as part of the regular, um, regular army instead of raised for the duration of the emergency. Um, uh, recruiting went so well that George Marshall remembers he's traveling from Pennsylvania to San Francisco on a train with his units. And they get on the train. They get off the train in San Francisco with more people than they got on the train. Because they would stop at these little towns on the way across America, and these 18-year-old kids would jump up and join the unit. Just, and the soldiers would say, yeah, hide with us, and come on in. So there was actually a big wave of, of sort of enthusiastic volunteering for it very, uh, in, the, in the first couple of years. In 01 and 02, that trailed off a little bit more, and they were, they were looking to um, uh, keep them uh, uh, part of the regular army and more structured. Uh, one of the most fascinating cases is uh, African-American soldiers. Um, the units of African-American soldiers were sent over to the Philippines to fight. And they sort of you know, kind of wondered what's going on, because they, they get off the boat, and you know, the white American soldiers are calling the Filipinos niggers. And the African-American soldiers are saying, well, wait a minute. Who are we supposed to be fighting again? What's, what's going on? There's a, there's a famous moment, which may be apocryphal, a unit of African-American soldiers get off, and a white soldier says, what, you know, what are you coons doing here? Give my language. And the African-American soldiers say, we're picking up the white man's burden. <laughs> now, that's just a little too good, too quick. So I'm a little suspicious. When my wife says something snotty to me, I'm not that quick. So, uh, but uh, I'll give them credit. Um, Uh, yeah, the questions about getting uh, deploying American troops from the Presidio in San Francisco across the Philippines. Oh yes, oh yes, and there are there are hundreds of of excellent sort of excellent excellently entertaining stories about this. Yeah, we were not ready to supply the U.S. was not ready to supply a long distance war, and so we were operating on a shoestring, just as much out of San Francisco as we had been out of Tampa. Um, the one, the story that leaps to me in mind now is the soldiers got on these warships and um, there were, they had sent, um, the U.S. had sent the first of these newfangled washing machines to wash the soldiers' uniforms on the way over. And so the soldiers stripped down to their skivvies and they put them into the washing machines and they sort of started turning the handle and the washing machines promptly ripped them to shreds. And so one of the soldiers I read about talked about how some of his friends were walking around in, in naked except for their socks. <laughs> and they had no uniforms of this thing. And that, you, there are more of those stories than I have time to relate. So yeah, we had very serious problems um, getting them shipped across. Thank you, very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a political tradition. It's a tradition we've established many years ago. But you probably noticed your poster outside. Uh, and uh, so as I can get it out of here, uh, we usually present our speakers with a copy of their poster that they can take back with them. Again, thank you very much. Excellent lecture. Thank you.